I've been working at Cirque du Soleil for seven years now. Um, and when I got the job, I bet all my friends I would be working at Cirque for two years, you know, and how complex could it be to do marketing for a company like Cirque du Soleil? You do a poster, and a character, you put a logo, and, and that's it. And actually, I've discovered uh, over the past couple of years that the Cirque du Soleil brand is a lot more complex and interesting than it looks, from the outside at least. And today, I'd like to take you on the journey of trying to explain to you what I think makes this brand so unique. How is this brand able to connect uh, with the consumers the way it does? Before we go any further, uh, I'd like to, to get to know uh, you and, and uh, how many of you have already seen a, a Cirque du Soleil show by show of hands? So a good fraction of the room. So maybe for those who haven't seen Cirque du Soleil uh, live before, let's look at the quick video clip and, and you'll see what Cirque du Soleil is. Every time I look at this video, it looks so easy to do, right? It looks very, very easy. It's much more complex uh, than it looks. There are a couple, um, I think, principles that uh, we can share today of what made Cirque du Soleil so, so powerful. Um, so we'll talk about four main ideas. It could be themes. You can call them philosophies. You can call them many different things. And hopefully, I, um, I've built this content in thinking, how can these principles help other brands, help other organizations? So, I'm hoping that you guys will also be able to connect your reality with what we live at Cirque du Soleil. The first uh, thing that Cirque du Soleil did in becoming uh, the brand that it is today is creating a, a unique marketplace. There is a very famous uh, case study uh, called uh, Blue Ocean. I don't know if you, ha you ha maybe you have re read it uh, before, but basically the idea of this case study is to say that Cirque du Soleil created a marketplace that didn't exist before, and so that they call that uh, an, a blue ocean as opposed to a red ocean, which is an ocean filled of uh, uh, competition and the blood of, uh, of sharks, if you want. Um, what Cirque du Soleil has been basically doing is not completely new. Um, reinventing circus is not uh, what Cirque du Soleil did. Cirque du Soleil actually um, surfed on something that was already existing. New circus existed in Europe in the uh, 1970s, so way before we were founded in 84. But what we've been doing is two things. One, we fused uh, circus with new and our different disciplines. So fusing circus with dance, theater, fashion. We've also been um, making it commercial, which was not what the other small companies or small troops in Europe were doing back then. So fusing different genres. Um, and uh, this became basically our essential uh, differentiation strategy. This is the one thing that makes Cirque du Soleil so unique today. Since the beginning, since 84, we've sold 150 million tickets around the world, which is uh, quite a lot of people, uh, I'd like to say. Um, and this, everything we did has, had a big impact on, on live entertainment, so 35 shows since inception. Tonight, 20 shows are going to be performing, 20 Cirque du Soleil shows around the world are going to be performing uh, in different places. So it had a major influence on live entertainment. It had a major influence on uh, spectacles as a whole. If you think of the um, opening ceremonies of the Olympic Games, there is nothing that looks more like a Cirque du Soleil show than those type of events. So they have actually borrowed from the Cirque du Soleil signature, which creates then for us a challenge because now we have to fight with a lot of copycats and, 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 and uh, companies using the Cirque du Soleil signature. I, I think it's a good thing to inspire, but now it creates for us different challenges. Um, it also has uh, had a major impact in Las Vegas. Uh, it changed uh, the word of uh, the face of Las Vegas over the past uh, 20, 20 years, uh, 25 years, m helping move Las Vegas from a very gambling-centric uh, city to an entertainment-centric city. And now uh, the, 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 the revenues in Las Vegas are much, much uh, more uh, uh, important in terms of entertainment versus uh, gambling. 
The second thing um, that I'd like to say about this, that notion of transformation uh, is the idea that uh, it was not planned. Uh, let's kill this myth that Cirque du Soleil had the plan to reinvent circus. It's, it's not true. This is a picture of uh, one of the very first Cirque du Soleil shows, um, 86. Two things. One, first of all, you can see that this is a very typical circus ring, right? Every, everything you can find in any circus. The other thing, uh, having no animals, you know, is something that you, know, you hear a lot about Cirque du Soleil. Oh, Cirque has no animals. It was not an intent at the beginning. They just had no money to buy animals. <laughs> and the arch you see in the background here is big enough to fit an elephant underneath. So this shows how transformation was very organic, and organic is something very central to who we are and the way that our company works still today. Um, in transformation, uh, so we talked about uh, an organic process. Uh, what we've also been doing is uh, shattering cultural boundaries. Circus is a centuries uh, art form, right? This is something that has been existing forever. It, they, it goes back to the, to the, to the, the Romans, you know, and, and the gladiators was circus already. Uh, but bringing a product that had uh, an invented, that was based on an invented language, uh, remember, and for those who haven't seen Cirque du Soleil before, Cirque has, uh, doesn't speak the characters, are speaking in their own language, has been able, able uh, to help us travel around the world and visit uh, literally the five continents. When you think of a Broadway show that is created in New York, when they want to scale this to other countries, they have to translate, they have to make it work in different languages. In our case, the product is global. We're able to go beyond uh, frontiers. So since the beginning, uh, that's really, that has been a pillar of everything we did. Um, and so we retransformed a, a, a genre, and yet we've made sure that this was anchored in, in a cultural heritage. Circus was known and understood by most consumers in the world. Europe, uh, Russia, China, America, all had a circus tradition. So what we did is basically uh, presented a circus, so what people knew, what consumers knew from the beginning in a new way. Everything has been done under a very clear mission. This is 20 years old, it's still valid today. Everything we do at Cirque du Soleil aims at doing three things, invoking the imagination, provoking the senses, and evoking the emotions of people around the world. This is the mission of Cirque du Soleil. That's what we try to do and we aim to do at every touch point with our brand, at every product we create, and every time uh, someone hears the name Cirque du Soleil, we'd like them to think of being invoked, provoked, evoked. So first uh, idea was that notion of transformation. So taking a marketplace and turning it over, transforming that marketplace to create a new one, uh, a, a marketplace ideally free of competition, something that a lot of brands today are also doing. So this is an, an, an outside perspective, but from the, out, uh, from the inside, um, the Cirque du Soleil brand is also very unique, and the organization itself is very unique, in the sense that we work like a family. And so we, we talked about uh, external, now let's dive a little deeper into the inside of the company. The company was founded in, so, 84, and it started with a group of dreamers. It started with 73 people at the beginning, 73 employees, year one, uh, including all the artists, technicians, and anyone you can think of. Um, and uh, those dreamers, it was a very hippie uh, movement, uh, smoking pot and, uh, and enjoying life. Uh, and uh, those guys um, have had a dream, a very clear dream. Their dream was to, crea to create and to travel. And if they could make a living out of it, this was perfect. Um, so this was their initial intent. It was not to make Cirque du Soleil a multi-billion dollar company that it is today. It was a very simple and hippie dream. And the reason why I'm saying this is, uh, so now we're 30 years later and we have uh, 5,000 employees around the world. Uh, but that uh, spirit, the hippie philosophy, the hippie culture is still very present in the, in the company. It made and created a very strong and organic uh, corporate culture. The way that this company works is very, very unique. There are very few companies that can operate the same way. And when we hire, for example, a new employee, when I'm in an interview, I'm hiring half a resume and half a personality because I know that the culture is so strong that there are, there are high chances that that person is not going to fit with the culture. This informal culture um, has a, so a very strong influence on everything we do, the way we operate, and everyone has a role in this process. Everyone has a role in the creative process. Every employee is playing a, a key role in everything we do. That's made us a very connected uh, a company, very strong uh, culture, 
and that made uh, our employees the biggest fans and the biggest critics. They're the biggest fans because they're dedicated. They believe in what we do uh, at a level that you cannot even imagine. Uh, they're willing to surpass themselves. We're willing to work very hard for what they believe in uh, and, and what the company believes in. But they're also the biggest critics. And when your employees are both your fans and your critics, it keeps you on your toes. It helps the company have a sounding board on anything we do. And uh, this is a very, very crucial uh, element of our company. As an example, the very first uh, audience that, uh, when, when, let's say we have a show in creation, uh, the first night uh, with uh, an actual audience in the venue, in the room, are the employees. And uh, those employees are very critical, but also very supportive of the, of the uh, 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 artist on stage. And this is a very key moment for the artists. This is the first time that they are getting a live reaction from uh, human beings that are not in the creative process. And this shows how the employees are actually part of the process versus uh, looking at it from the outside. And so it keeps us on, on our toes. It also helps us to push uh, us further and uh, also to get back from the employees. Let me give you two examples of how, how much invested can our employees be. This picture here is a picture of a show we did in Montreal uh, in December in a church. It was a music concert. Uh, and for the, the, the finally, uh, the last number of this, uh, of this show, we, we needed uh, various characters. And instead of hiring uh, artists or uh, characters, uh, we said, why don't we ask our employees if they'd like to participate and to, to show up in this last uh, act. And actually, so all the, the characters you see on this, uh, on this picture are the, are the employees that actually have been giving their time for three weeks every night coming to this church after our work and, 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 and giving back to the audience. Another example, same idea in Las Vegas, we have an event every year called One Night for One Drop. One Drop is our foundation working in, in the, 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 the water sector. And uh, we close all of our eight Las Vegas shows for one night. And uh, we have all the artists from all the shows putting together a one night only uh, uh, charity event. And those guys work like crazy. They, they, they work uh, during the weekend, they work at night, they work during the day to be able to put this event, which is a very, very, very high production value uh, event. So it's, it shows you how your employees and our employees in our case, uh, because they're so committed, can actually surpass themselves and go beyond what you would expect from a normal employee. Of course, um, you have to, I mean, it's, it's a, it's a two-way relationship, right? So we are making sure we can nourish the creativity from the, uh, from the inside. It's very central for us that the creativity happens at every level of the company. It's not a right only for the creative team. Creativity can happen at different levels. And as an example, we're, ha we're launching a program as we speak called Eureka. Eureka is a program to help us propel business, operational, or creative ideas throughout the company. And this can come from any employee, and uh, we're, we're helping them make those ideas come to life. We, we talked about a, a way to transform what was existing before. We talked about how, how the, the role of the employees, uh, the role that they play in this transformation. I was in, in London uh, two weeks ago giving a, a conference on, uh, on, uh, on brand experience and consumer experience, and, and I was asked, well, uh, how do you, I mean, how do you handle the customer experience at Cirque du Soleil? And so I was like, well, that's weird, because for us, the product is the experience. I mean, there is no customer experience. We made the product the experience. And this also is a central pillar in, in the, the uniqueness of the Cirque du Soleil brand. When we say that the, the, the product is the experience, it actually means that uh, going to a Cirque du Soleil show for most consumers is beyond going to see any show or beyond buying a product. Cirque du Soleil is more than entertainment. This is a real exper experience. What I mean by that is when you ask consumers uh, what feelings did you express when you, when, you, when you saw a Cirque du Soleil show, you would hear things like um, amazement, happiness, exhilaration, sadness, fear. Those emotions, many brand, brands in the world could deliver those emotions. Many shows could deliver those emotions. Go uh, see a, a Broadway show, go see a music concert. You could be amazed, you could be happy. But there is a layer of emotional connection with the consumer that goes way deeper and way beyond those uh, entertainment emotions. Things like, I, sp I, I felt hope. I felt spirituality. I felt nostalgia. I felt an urge to surpass myself. 
I think humbly that very few brands can deliver this layer of connection. And this is something we're nurturing and something we're very conscious is fragile and that we have to make sure we protect uh, with everything that we do. And this ultimately has become our number one marketing weapon, word of mouth, thanks to the power of the, the, the emotion, the emotional power, sorry, of the, of the experience has become our number one marketing driver. It's the number one awareness driver. It's the number one ticket sales driver by far. It beats any TV campaign you can think of. It beats anything else you could do. Word of mouth is what made Cirque du Soleil uh, very unique and successful uh, today. As an example, a side note, um, when uh, we went in the US for the first time in 86, so f f uh, two years after being created, first of all, uh, those guys were a little crazy and they, they took a one-way ticket to LA and uh, there was a festival in LA uh, Cirque du Soleil was the opening act of that festival, and they said, we're gonna take a one-way ticket, and if we make money, if we do well, we'll come back, if not, we'll find a way. And they bet everything on word of mouth. They invited all the celebrities in, La in Los Angeles and all the key influencers, and it worked. So from day one, word of mouth has been the main and central strategy of Cirque du Soleil. There is an, an indicator that maybe you guys use in your uh, own organizations or with your own brands called the NPS, Net Promoter Score. I don't know if any of you know this, uh, this indicator, but this is basically a simple indicator measuring the propensity to recommend a brand. So on a scale from zero to 10, how likely are you to recommend XYZ brand? And you take the nine and tens promoters and zero to six detractors. And so that's the difference between promoters and detractors. Cirque du Soleil has an NPS of 85. And it's not a peeing contest. Uh, our goal is not to have the biggest NPS there is, but I, when I compare this NPS with other brands like Harley, 81, Apple, 78, Costco, 66, again, I don't really care about having a, a bigger or, small, or smaller NPS. What I care about is those brands like Harley, Apple are able to connect with their consumers the way that very few brands are. And this is really the, the one secret sauce of Cirque du Soleil. When you drive a Harley, you don't drive any bike. When, when you have a Mac computer, you don't bring a computer to a meeting, you bring your Mac. Even Costco, I'm often joking in presentations, but people would kill for this brand. They're so proud of having their Costco membership card, right? And, and so there's a sense of belonging, a sense of commitment that goes beyond uh, consuming a product. The fourth idea, uh, and because we talked about word of mouth, is that because we, we are a word of mouth based company, we treat the brand like a celebrity. Everything we do at Cirque du Soleil and everything I guess most brands are doing in the world is to create desire. That's what we want at the end of the day. We want consumers to desire us. The way we do so is a couple things. First of all, our brand was built on scarcity. Um, this is a principle that most organizations are very afraid of. I'm going to have less product in the marketplace, but I'm going to be creating more desire. Uh, for us, scarcity is a couple of things. First of all, uh, since the beginning, we've had the image that Cirque du Soleil is a very hard to get ticket. Today, we have 20 shows. No, I'm gonna ruin a secret, but no, not all, our, our, all of our shows are sold out every night. They are selling very well, but there is a perception in the head of consumers that uh, Cirque du Soleil is, 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 is a hard to get ticket, and that is a feeding uh, desire. The second idea is that there is a very long time of, a long lead time uh, between each consumption of the product. If, if you're not going to Las Vegas or to Orlando to see a, one of our, of our permanent shows, you're gonna see Cirque du Soleil when Cirque du Soleil comes to town. And that creates an event. And so that creates desire through that question of uh, the, the, time, uh, the time lapse between two consumption experience. The third idea in, in, in scarcity is that we don't duplicate our shows. If you want to see O, there's only one place in the world where you can see O, and this is in Las Vegas. There are no two, three, four, five O's around the world. So if you desire a product, you have to go to Las Vegas to see it. When you create desire, when you build your brand on scarcity, uh, for us, it's also about mystery. Mystery sells. Most uh, companies are trying to, uh, to kill the mystery or remove as much mystery as they can when they communicate, but mystery do sell. I'm thinking of an artist like Sia. I don't know if you guys know, know that, uh, that, that singer, but uh, lately she has a very successful album and, and she actually uh, was nominated for a couple of Grammys uh, two weeks ago and, and she refuses to show her face on TV. Is it because, as she says, she has a, 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 a phobia uh, of being seen in public, or is it because of her anti-fame manifesto? Who cares, right? 
What matters is that it sells because she creates mystery. And so ultimately, when you create mystery, you leave space for consumers to dream. You speak to the heart before you speak to the brain. And again, a very central uh, philosophy in the way that we do marketing. If Cirque du Soleil was, was communicating like most brands in the world, we would say, come and see our 62 acrobats. They're going to do triple flips, and you'll see an amazing uh, trapeze act at the end, and, uh, and someone will pretend to fall, and he will not. But, um, <laughs> but that's not the way we communicate. We, use, uh, we are much more uh, abstract, much more mysterious. And in our case, it does really uh, work much better than speaking to the, to, to the, to the brain. And when you treat your brand like a celebrity, when you create desire, you consider your clients like fans. And in our case, when I started working at Cirque du Soleil, I was uh, arguing and fighting with my colleagues that were calling all of our clients fans. I was like, hold on, a fan is a fan, a client is a client, and there are maybe X percent of fans in our client base. But then I'm like, wait, if Disney is calling their, their clients guests, why don't we call our clients fans? it puts you in a very different perspective as a brand. It, it changes the way that you look at your consumer, uh, that you, the way that you look at your client. And uh, today we have a database of 4 million uh, Circular members. It's a, a database that people subscribe to to get uh, service only information. And these people that would, you could consider our, as our core fans sell 30% of our tickets. 30% of our tickets in, in the cities that we visit are sold to our uh, Circular members. So treat your, client, treat your, your clients like, like fans, but then also so it gives you a different responsibility. If, the, if you consider that your clients are your fans, then you, have a lot, you owe a, a lot more back to those consumers. You have to treat them with a lot of respect, and you're also conscious that the relationship you have with your clients is very fragile, and you have to nurture this relation, relationship. And let me tell you um, a story of... Uh, one of our biggest fans, her name is Michelle, and Michelle lives in uh, New Jersey, and she's one of the biggest Cirque du Soleil fans. Actually, we found her recently. She was one of the very first Cirque Club member, that database I was talking about. And she comes to Montreal every other year when we premiere our new shows in Montreal. Every new show starts in Montreal, a uh, big top show in Montreal, and she comes every year. And last year, she came for uh, our new production, and we organized a surprise for her with her husband. She was eight months pregnant. I was literally afraid she would give birth to the baby <laughs> in our offices, which could have been cool, actually, a great story to tell in conferences. Sadly, I won't tell that story today. But let me show you a video of Michelle uh, and, and, and her experience at Cirque du Soleil for the day. I'm Michelle Viola. I'm 29. I've been a surf club member more than half my life. We're in a car going to Cirque du Soleil in Montreal. Don't know what to expect. I'm very, very excited. Come on in. I very much appreciate everyone taking just a minute of their day to make this day one day I will never forget for the rest of my life. And it's been magic and I really appreciate it. I really do. So let me tell you that this was a very uh, special day for Michelle. It was also a very, very special day for all of us. And just thinking about it, you know, I have shivers down my spine. And, it, seeing the, the way that she was reacting to being, just simply visiting the Cirque du Soleil studios was, was mind-blowing and, and reminded all of us why we come to work every morning. And this is something that was very, very important. It was as important for Michelle as it was for us that day. Okay, let me quickly um, recap those four main principles that, again, I think many brands could apply in their, in their lives. How can a brand define a new marketplace? How can you create a culture in your companies that enable you to work like a family and go beyond a work relationship? How can you make the product the experience instead of making, making the product experiential or spending a lot of dollars 
in creating a customer experience that doesn't necessarily exist? And then how do you treat the brand like a celebrity? These are four main ideas that made uh, Cirque du Soleil what the brand is today and, and how the, that brand has been able to connect with consumers. For us now, we're, we just turned 30 last year, uh, and this is becoming a very interesting uh, time. It has always been, but it will be even more. You know, I, I like to think uh, of Cirque du Soleil like a, a human being, you know, and we, at the age of 10, uh, we uh, had our first shows in Las Vegas, so we had the first, the first 10 years were childhood, discovery, unlimited energy, and then we, we turned 10, had a, home, had a home in Las Vegas, and teenagehood through uh, the age of 24, 25, when the economic crisis uh, hit us quite, quite strongly because of the, the, the importance that Las Vegas has in our businesses. So at the age of 24, left uh, teenagehood, enter uh, adulthood, uh, graduated, graduated university, had to pay the first bills, uh, oh my god, I'm short this month, so what am I going to do? And so we had to make our first uh, trials, and er trial, trials and errors, uh, first mistakes. Uh, and now we're turning 30, and I think when you turn 30, uh, you, um, you are at a point in your life where you want to start building a family, you want to maintain stability, and this is exactly where Cirque du Soleil is today. And this will actually um, happen through uh, expanding our creativity to other spheres. So for us, the next challenge now that we've built this brand is to expand this brand to new territories. Let me show you very quickly to finish a couple examples of, of projects that we are working on right now, just so you understand what I mean by expanding creativity. This is Avatar. We are working on a, on a show with uh, James Cameron that will be opening uh, next year in Montreal and then tour the world. Uh, so how can you translate and, and reinvent existing IP through uh, our own uh, creative mindset? This is a, a picture of a nightclub in Las Vegas that we opened last year uh, that fuses uh, performance with uh, very famous DJs and a visually rich uh, environment. So how do you attract a younger crowd, younger consumers through uh, products like nightclub? We just announced uh, last week a partnership with uh, Ferran Adria, a very famous uh, chef behind El, El Bulli in Spain. So how do you, how do you what, was, what would be a, a Cirque du Soleil restaurant? What, did, what, would it, what would it look like? You know, how do you transfer the creativity of Cirque du Soleil to things like a restaurant? Kids is, is a no-brainer, it looks, right? Uh, how do you create uh, experiences for kids that are emotionally connecting, but that go beyond what already exists in the marketplace? How do you spark creativity among, uh, amongst kids? That's one question that we're looking at right now and looking at a first TV show that could then expand into live and many different things. And finally, we, are, uh, we have announced recently that, um, that we're working on, on a project of a theme park or an amusement park or an immersive park, still uh, TBD. But how do you make consumers live the brand much more immersively than ever? That's one question that we're looking at right now with uh, projects like, like theme parks. There is one certainty when you're a creative company, and it is that you're going to fail. We failed before. Every time we failed, uh, I'm grateful we did, because it helped us go further. And so there's one certainly you're going to fail. Uh, the question is, how do you fail forward? How do you learn from those mistakes? And everything we do in failing forward is making sure we ultimately stay true to our creative process. We are a creatively driven company. We have to stay a creatively driven company. Everything has to come from creation first. And then when you do so, ultimately, as our founder uh, always says, uh, impossible is uh, only a word. Thank you very much for your attention.